Does the channel provide value? Focus on the foundation. I am a travel blogger. It's always about communication. Build those partnerships. What are the problems that you solve for your clients? Just being ahead on the technological side of things. Leading an organization. You not only want to survive, but you want to thrive. Thrive. They said it wouldn't last, and they said that you can't drive profitable and incremental revenue through the affiliate channel. But here we are, 20 years later, and the affiliate channel is alive and kicking and generating profitable revenue for thousands of retailers across the globe. Hi, I am Jamie Birch, your host of the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast, where we talk to some of the industry's best and brightest about their careers, about leadership, and about how to drive profitable revenue through the affiliate channel. Welcome to the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast. I am your host, Jamie Birch, and the CEO and founder of jebcommerce.com, your affiliate management marketing agency. If you are looking for help with your affiliate program, you want to acquire new customers, you want to generate revenue and find new pockets of affiliates, one thing we talk about with our guests today, definitely let us know at jebcommerce.com. We would love to help you. Now, today I have an awesome guest. I have Chris Tredgett, the CMO at Publisher Discovery, one of the PMA board of directors and co-founder of Publisher Discovery. Chris has been in the affiliate industry uh, for almost as long as I have, back to, I think, 2003. Uh, he has had many different positions, worked with many different startups in the space, and now runs Publisher Discovery, one of the best vendors if you're looking for affiliate recruitment. So if you think you know all the affiliates that you have, if you think you know what spaces and categories are emerging in the affiliate channel right now, then this is the podcast for you. We go in depth into affiliate marketing and affiliate recruitment and the service and offering that Publisher Discovery has for you. So definitely give it a listen. Let us know what you think. And you know what? Enjoy my conversation with Chris Trejet. Well, Chris, thank you for joining me on the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast. For our listeners, I have with me today, Chris Trejet. Trejet? Trejet? <laughs> Dragnet, yeah, I've messed it up already. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take any of those. <laughs> awesome. And Chris, you are the CMO at Publisher Discovery, uh, one of the premier vendors in the affiliate industry. Thank you so much for joining us today. Absolute pleasure, Jamie. Thanks very much for having me. Yeah, no problem. And you, where are you joining us from right now? Um, in Cheshire, which is just southwest of Manchester in the UK. Outstanding. Technology is uh, fantastic. And uh, is the weather nice there right now? We have a beautiful sunny day today. It's um, it's picking up, but being kind of Manchester and Cheshire, it's famously wet. Uh, if you're in Manchester, it's normally raining. Uh, so <laughs> we've got a, a rare dry day, but nice. it's all good for the uh, the veggies growing outside the back here. <laughs> always good. Always good. We my I took my family to uh, to London and Scotland, I think mm. now two years ago. And we had the unseasonally beautiful Scotland week. It was beautiful yeah. the entire week. It rained once. Uh, and everyone there told us to enjoy it. And when we come back, we won't see the sun. <laughs> <laughs> That's about right for Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we've, uh, you know, over in the UK, how have things been going with the pandemic? Are you guys seeing upticks? How are things the last couple months? Things have changed so much here. Yeah, um, I've not really followed other countries apart from Australia, where my daughter lives, um, and they've had a few cases, which means everybody's locked down. You know, a few cases, yeah. not a few deaths, just a few cases. Um, but here we're we've kind of gone down. There's a bit of an uptick at the moment, but that's because everything's being opened up. And we had last weekend, we had all the Premiership football with full stadiums. So Manchester United has seventy thousand people in it, uh, all kind of. Uh, <laughs> Going mad for the uh, the five nil was it five one the score line absolutely mad, uh, so wow. um, yeah, and I I know that uh, Wade Tonkin would be very happy about uh, last week's or this week's performance from Tottenham Hotspur when uh, Son scored an absolute screamer uh, beating Manchester City one nil. But sorry, it's enough about football, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm sure Wade will be super stoked and, and to think about seventy thousand people in a stadium for anything mm. at any time is 
unreal. Uh, but yeah. now uh, we we just had some uh, music festivals, and they're tracking mm. huge uh, COVID outbreaks. Uh, oh, you know, back to those. So very very interesting. Now you mm. told me on our prep call you developed uh, a new and a new skill uh, over the pandemic. And that is you, you you've become quite the barber. <laughs> Just for myself. Uh, yeah, I kind of for, for about six months or something, nine months, couldn't book a, a barber's appointment. So uh, I just bought one of these kind of quick whizzy things. So I've uh, dead easy to do the backs and sides and whatever, but the top is always a bit of a challenge. So sometimes it looks a little bit hacked about like it is at the moment. Um, <laughs> so it depends on what happens and who's shouting when in the background when, <laughs> while I'm in the middle of it. <laughs> oh, that's great. No, you look fantastic for our listeners. Uh, uh, Chris and I actually get to see each other while we're recording. Our CFO at JEB, she had her husband, uh, who owns a ton of properties, a farmer in the area, uh, cut her hair uh, during uh, COVID, and my wife wouldn't let me touch her hair yeah. with the scissors. That's at a all. brave and man. That's a brave, a man. brave, a brave man, a brave woman, and an incredibly talented man. He did a superb job with her wow. uh, styling. That was something that come out, but that's that's fantastic. So, what's the last eighteen months been like for you and publisher discovery? It's been a very interesting time, actually. We haven't, because we're so many steps back from the coalface in terms of kind of doing the actual stuff, we have noticed that, you know, obviously um, travel and a few other areas we're not getting the inquiries from, but online stuff and streaming, that's happening. Um, so in reality, we've just grown steadily over the past 18 months, um, got more direct clients, we are uh, working with a few more networks and um, SaaS providers uh, um, with partnerships. Uh, so we kind of now with uh, Tune, Cake, Partnerize, Link Connector, Affiliate Future, and a few others as well. You lose track, Red Track is one of them as well, uh, based in Vilnius. Awesome. Um, and there are more happening as well, I'm just about to, um, which I can't announce quite yet, but um, um, each one of those will have a slightly different integration. So it's been quite exciting and we've also had the opportunity um, to upgrade the dev in the background, upgrading the AI and machine learning. Yeah, and there's a lot of new stuff been happening. It's been quite fun. And, and all of that with not having met a member of staff for about six months at one point. Yeah, has that been a <laughs> difficult transition for you? I know we haven't, I, we're having an offsite in person for the first time and I will see, I've only seen one employee since we went remote so a full year now wow and i will i will get to see yeah. everybody uh face to face at the end of september so has, has that transition been difficult for you not massively because i've been i've worked remote for 10 8 10 years or something anyway generally speaking um personally um and we are strung out around the country and even more so now with re recruiting during the pandemic didn't matter where anyone was. So we have uh, a guy up in the East Coast uh, near Lincoln, and we've got um, a girl in demand gen who's in Essex. And people in the UK will understand that being a long, yeah, yeah. long way. I mean, in the US, it's kind of round yeah. the corner. Um, you don't mind driving five or six hours. That In the UK, that's <laughs> madness. You wouldn't even think about it. Um, but we're all spread around the country. And so kind of we have – kind of morning and afternoon meetings on zoom and stuff like that so kind of um we're as connected as we ever were and with quite a lot of techie people they don't like meeting anyway yeah or you're talking on the phone actually getting them to turn the camera on is quite <laughs> yeah tricky. in the beginning we had a big problem with that and my my first foray into managing remote employees was probably eight years ago and we had a couple employees move uh, to different parts of the country for different reasons and getting them to turn on the camera, it took forever. Now, I think now we're at a, a, a point, I did a prep call with someone who uh, would never have turned on the, the video prior to COVID, but now everyone does. And we're all, not many mm. people get prepared for it, like maybe five years ago where you would have got dudded out, you know, and ready mm. to go for it. Um, but talk to me about your career. How did you find yourself here as a CMO of Publisher Discovery? Jeez. Um, 
it's <clears throat> I think it's when you skate across a pond um, as a, I don't know, as a frog, you're looking from lily pad from lily pad which, where you go, and it's just the choices you make as you're going across the pond of life, I suppose, isn't it? If you think in those I love kind that of terms, analogy. and some of them were a little bit, a little bit bizarre. I mean, I started off, um, God, I did history of art at, at uh, college, and um, from there, um, I ran a pub for four years. Uh, what else did I do? Um, Ran a fine art materials warehouse in London for a year and a half or so, and then started doing some graphic stuff. So I became a graphic designer almost in a small printer's uh, and was doing those page makeups on an eight inch black and white Mac, if you oh, remember yeah. doing that on the little kind of vertical yeah. box one. You, you try doing a two page spread on, on one of those, that's real, <laughs> really oh, exciting, yeah. <laughs> um, especially when it's in for four color. So, uh, back in those days, we had to film plan manually. So, I was turning out the text on those. This was after doing the, the early versions, which will have been sending what was HTML down a phone line on a 9600 board. Yeah, and you get the, the galleys back the following day. Going to the eight inch Mac was absolute <laughs> dream, it saved hours or days. If work. That's awesome. <laughs> but yeah, so I did that. And uh, yeah, I've been s scooting around that kind of industry since then. And how did you find your way to affiliate marketing? Um, I was working for a design agency as a bag carrier. I think it's the, uh, the posh term is account manager. Um, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, uh, I would be told, oh, there's a, there's a brief at Procter & Gamble, there's a brief at wherever it might be. So we were working with some quite big people in the north of England, this was. So Procter & Gamble is one of the big offices up there, gone now from there. Uh, Nissan and a few others. Um, and um, it was about the time of the start of the internet stuff happening properly, about 1990-ish. Um, and I do remember uh, selling website designs like one pages for thousands of pounds you know one page website built in something like Dreamweaver oh, yeah, yeah. or oh god yeah, knows what it was, you know, all those weird <laughs> bits of software Front yeah page. um and uh oh yeah uh, and yeah uh, quark express 2 yeah, page maker yeah. one. i used page maker on a mac to lay out the high school newspaper so i remember trying to get two page layouts <laughs> on that small screen yeah fun and games yeah uh so and because of that, I ended up working for, I went and pitched for some business with GE for the Global Exchange, which back in those days was incredibly techy. Um, and it was a direct mail campaign and we needed somebody who could understand, um, who could do, do some stuff with this huge database segmenting and whatever. And a friend of a friend said, oh, you should speak to this guy, Steve Brown. And uh, so I rung Steve Brown and Steve said, yeah, my brother can do that. Um, I met him on a roundabout in southwest London. We went to GE, got the contract. It's quite a nice little one, actually. It's about £37,000, I think it was. And it was quite wow, a lot yeah. of cash back then. Uh, and Steve was happy. And then we lost a couple of big clients. I got made redundant from the agency. <laughs> Shit happens. And then um, I saw Steve... I saw this company with something internet. I thought that looks interesting. So I answered the advert, you know, a little kind of tiny advert for Perfiliate Technologies um, back in 2002. Um, ended up speaking to Steve and joined them. And there was myself and Mal Cowley in the office in the middle of Newcastle and Paul Fellows in an attic in South Shields down the road and Steve down in South London in, in Reading in Berkshire. Uh, and we were the start of Biat, so that was uh, oh, okay. that's how I ended up in affiliate, totally by default. We weren't even an affiliate network in O2. And what did you guys do in O2? <laughs> it was supposed to be a fundraising thing. So the buy dot at was the slash was supposed to be for a, a charity, and it was charity. It was like fifteen years ahead of its time, uh, easy yeah, fundraising, yeah, yeah. and um, you know and. Um, um give as you spend and all those kinds of things um so it was way too far ahead of its time uh we got funding to do it um it was going a bit kind of rocky and then the way i hear it from mal is that mal and paul basically says yeah oh, we've got some links here from marks and spencer and a few others here let's see if we can get some some more business on there so they started getting commercial guys to kind of put buy at 
top cash back or buy it or whatever it was back then. Um, and uh, so we ended up with some affiliates on those programs and then we just grew and grew. It was about the same time that CJ.com had its um, main domain blocked by Norton. So I managed to pick off a huge number of those of their clients, as Steve Winterhalter will tell you. Oh, yeah. Um, if you remember him, he was, he was the UK sales guy and I was just eating <laughs> off his table. I like that, eating <laughs> off his table. And so, <laughs> yeah, it was that a is, fun time. Yeah. You go back to, you know, the, that was three, three, you know, yeah. really yeah. the emergence of this channel as a, as a powerhouse. What was that like as Bayat kind of went through, uh, you know, a complete business model change? Um, seat of the pants job it really was i mean we were we'd heard that you did a program for oh it's 30 percent override isn't it yeah so that's what we did and one program i remember we won from <clears throat> dgm which yeah. back in those days um was a one of the leading networks in the uk and part of europe um <clears throat> we won the program we pitched for it and we knew affiliates were getting 20 pounds cpa so, okay so 20 plus six that's 26 so we we pitched for 26 only when we got an absolutely anguished phone call from DGM's uh, founder and CEO saying, <laughs> what are you doing? What are you doing? You're upsetting the Apple cart. Apparently, they were they were giving the affiliates 20 and billing the client 50. Oh, wow. That's an override. Yes. That's an override and a half. But um, <laughs> I'm sure Adrian won't mind me saying that nowadays. <laughs> but it's, it's wrong. It's been... And as they say, we've all passed a lot of water since then. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we had to learn the affiliate industry on the hoof, um, and we won some decent clients. Uh, AOL seemed to enjoy what we were doing anyway. A few yeah, years later, yeah, definitely. So yeah, that was a fun time. Fun time. That's it fantastic. Was, yeah. um, now, was there any did was there any kind of blunder you made in your career that you had to overcome? Any any kind of uh, ooh, that's the wrong lily pad. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Uh, yeah. Loads. When I was running a fine art warehouse, there was a, a corker, absolute corker. I was importing some paint brushes from France, and I looked at the the French catalogue because it was the days of paper yeah, catalogues. Yeah. yeah. And uh, what ended up happening was instead of ordering twelve, I ordered twelve cases <laughs> of sab sable brushes, which was even back in those down days would have been thousands of pounds. Um, so yeah, uh, they took some of them back, but we ended up having to do a, a promotion to to sell them. Yeah, made a profit, a slim profit in the wrong, but selling all of those sable brushes. I mean, luckily it was a big place, so there was quite quite a bit of turnover. But uh, that's yeah, yeah, stuff you stuff you do when you're kind of uh, skipping the lily, lily oh, yeah, pads. Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> um, what's kept you in the affiliate space since then? Because it sounds like. Uh, I love hearing about all the different things, pub owner, <laughs> fine art materials. Like these are, <laughs> I, I totally get that. I love uh, the entrepreneurialism and, and the, the, you know, finding all these new things, but you've been in the affiliate space now for, uh, for as long, uh, almost as long as I have, you know, mm. for, for quite a number mm. of years, almost 20 years now. Mm. What's kept you in it? Yeah. Um, it's, it's just that, the fun of it all and it's it's unlike most other every whether you're kind of working as an actual startup or whether as we were working with or AOL effectively it f still felt like kind of the agile startup thing so if you fancy doing something you just did it um and it's all about I think when you're inventing an industry on the hoof you you've kind of fail, maybe fail big, but you learn fast and you don't fail a second time. So it's, it's, it's all about kind of fail fast, learn fast, that kind of thing, you know, where you, you kind of, yeah, that didn't work. What should we try something else? And it's the same in any business, you know, you try stuff, uh, you throw some, I can't say the word, but yeah, you throw yeah. it at the barn door and whatever sticks is great. We'll have that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> whatever hits the floor, you kind of plow back in. Yeah. And that's, I think that's one of the things <laughs> that kept, has kept me in it too. Uh, that, and you can test something, <clears throat> like you said, throw a bunch of things on the wall. You're going to find out very quickly how they did. And years ago I did mm -hmm. a personality test, uh, when I started at Coldwater Creek, this is 2000. And those were the relationship building was something I was really good at and I needed in my work strategy. 
communication and then mm-hmm. imme- you know response immediate response of my input so getting feedback quickly on what i was doing and that's one of the mm-hmm. things i love about it is you can go out you can do some things and you can you, you know you get results very quickly so you can continue to innovate and yeah. uh iterate yeah exactly yeah i mean and that was that was fascinating when you kind of i'm thinking back to buyout days because we literally were kind of see if it works put up that commission did it work um and yeah there was some some mad stuff happened but you know there was some very good stuff happened as well and i think in reality we developed bizarrely a really great business from from ground up but we had some great advice from good investors and the people that came in steve had uh, a great way of running stuff he knew when his limit, unlike so many mm-hmm. chief execs and founders, he knew when the limit of his knowledge was and when he should get somebody in and him drop down to COO. And that was that was the uh, the hockey stick moment for the company. That's a really good, you know, one of, one of my questions is you've been through several startups, several businesses that sold. Mm. And is that one of your major learnings of the successful CEOs know when, you know, they hit their limit? Yeah. Well, I think with anything, a successful business leader is somebody who knows where the gaps are and you, you plug them. If the gap is above you, like, hey, you've got to have the self-awareness and not just it's not just how high you can pee up the wall. It's a case of knowing that somebody there can do it much better than you with more style and grace and actually deliver better yeah. results. Um, and that way, kind of what you're doing ends up so much bigger. And that's the same with any relationship Um, where two and two makes five is always where it wins. Yeah, that's really, uh, really unique. Um, In that study of when to step down, uh, did you, was that difficult Mm. for the company to make that transition? I think from Steve's point of view, he's not a man with a massive ego. He's, he's a a PhD scientist. He worked on the CERN project uh, on kind of all that kind of stuff. So uh, it was, uh, and he's not kind of hard-headed business person. Actually, being able to step down, I think I recall Mal Cowley stepped down recently at Partnerize, and I guess a similar kind of thing. He recognised, okay, I've taken it where I can. Somebody else comes in. I've not spoken to Mal, so my apologies, Malcolm, if that's completely off beam. But there you go. That's no, great. <laughs> um, he saw it. He saw Steve do exactly that. Yeah, that, that and a great model uh, model to have. What What do you think? Um, what do you wish you knew about startups and going through that uh, selling acquisition process uh, that you didn't back then, but you know now? We didn't see an awful lot of it being kind of part of the team. Steve, I know, was spent when we were being acquired by AOL. Steve spent many, many hours walking between lawyers' offices across the city of London and things like that and drafting massive, great documents. Um, and I wish I'd known how complicated setting up a business was. I'd never set up a business really on the fly myself ever before 2016 when I thought, okay, let's do, let's do this. We set up Publisher Discovery as a separate company. Yeah. And the learning process on actually just business admin, you think, oh, shit, this is all stuff that other people do. Um, I've no idea how to do that. How do you do that? What's a W8 then? What's a, you know, all yeah, of that yeah. stuff. Um, so kind of having an IRS profile and, and all of those kinds of things. And uh, because we're so many of our clients were US based. Mm-hmm. And that was just like when me and Dan, the two of us were yeah. running Publisher Discovery. Uh, so, you know, um, and had to work out how, how banks worked and <laughs> all the rest of it, how tax worked. Yeah. Uh, but luckily we had some good people we could lean on. Um, our bank had a great accelerator in the town I lived, so we could go in and ask. So we had access to top-notch lawyers. I could run my kind of boilerplate T's and C's. They, Does this look all right? And they rewrote it for free, which is great. Uh, otherwise, it would have been a few thousand just for a rewrite. Um, so all of that kind of stuff was great to have. That's something that I, you know, in every community here stateside has those accelerators, those mentor groups or the college has something or the chamber of commerce, things like that. Uh, I often coach some, uh, new business owners and they had no idea it was there or were afraid to go ask for help. So you guys found it. How did that all work for you? How did it, how did, how did you go in? How did you start that? 
I just knew there was massive holes in my knowledge. So I, I thought, right, who can help? And luckily, this was when the internet existed, which is great. Um, so <laughs> I could just Google stuff. And I thought, all right, okay, <laughs> NatWest Business Accelerator. And you can go in, you can work in an office free of charge. Oh, I'll, have, I'll have a bit of that. Yeah, thank you very much. And I discovered there was all this other stuff, plus mentoring and kind of put some real structure behind it, you know, about all the kind of uh, proper marketing structure behind our notion of an idea of a business. And yeah, it seemed to work pretty well. Awesome. And bizarrely, recently, we've gone through a very similar process, but on a much more corporate level with startup core strengths. And that has been great. Just adding that process and a, an external view, um, working with Matt Lerner and Nopidon, and they're kind of really kind of shifting the tiller and putting us right on course for the next stage. That's fantastic. So they're coming in and looking at what you guys are doing, identify strength and weaknesses and, and help yeah. you chart a course for yeah. your next phase. Now, one thing I've noticed in, in just this conversation and definitely in, in our conversations in the past is, you know, this humility and self-awareness uh, that I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with. I would say it's they're probably their biggest bottleneck is, you know, that I don't know if it's arrogance or it's uh, pride or just, I got to get this done. I got to do it. I got to do it. I got to do it. Where does that come from for you? And and how important do you think that humility, self-awareness is to, to being successful as a business leader, but also in this channel? My wife wouldn't recognize I've got humility. I don't think. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> Well, she she's free, she can feel free to comment on the, when we publish this episode. That would be fantastic. Yeah. But she's not here at the moment. That's cool. Okay, yeah. Um, I I don't know if it is. I think a lot of people have a problem in, particularly if they're out of their depth, which everybody running a business successfully is going to be that bit out of their depth. You always are. If you're not out of your yep. depth, you're not trying hard enough. Um, and if you're out of their depth, you try to make everyone believe you're not. And so you're all bullish and you, you become quite defensive. And it's, it's that defensiveness which makes, I think, makes for the, the, the tricky interpersonals. So if you can kind of just cut the bullshit and, sorry, no. you can cut that one out if you want. <laughs> if you can just cut that and accept that, hey, not everyone knows everything, you know, um, and the stupidest question is the one that you didn't ask. Uh, so... I'm happy to ask anyone anything and to admit, yep, there's a big hole in my knowledge here. Okay, can you help me do this? And actually getting somebody in means that they feel great because you've asked them their opinion. And if you turn that around, don't you just love having your opinion asked? You so do, yeah. If you ask people other people, talking. you cement a relationship, which is what it's all about. And that drives those relationships, which helps your business, which helps you grow, and you haven't lost anything. Not even face. So, yeah. So uh, that's, that's my preach. Uh, uh, preach on. Amen. Keep going. You know, I, uh, I would say slash rant. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. We can rant here. Totally. Um, you know, I learned that lesson as a, as a leader on working on a client account with a client that we've had for, I think it's nine years now. Early on, wow. they used uh, they use an acronym for profitability that I didn't recognize. None of my team did. And uh, we, we didn't really even know how they calculated it, but they were so smart. It seemed like something we should know. Like there was a industry acronym, a financial acronym mm. that we should know that we didn't. And we Googled it. We couldn't find it. I, I, you know, we didn't ask them and I didn't ask anyone else. We tried to do this, you know, without letting anyone know. Well, after, after like six months, we asked them, okay we've been trying to figure this out. We got to come clean. And I thought we're going to lose the client. We're totally going to lose the client because we don't have all the answers. Mm. They told us what it was. It completely made sense. They didn't even have to tell us how to calculate it once they told us what the letter stood for. And in that moment, <laughs> they said, oh, you guys should have totally told us this is our own. No one else uses this. We developed this we wouldn't expect you to 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 know it uh and that was like you said that that built so there was it just was transparency it strengthened the relationship mm -hmm. that yeah. we still have going on a decade now working together so yeah. uh you know fantastic and that's uh, the key word the transparency isn't it yeah because if you're putting up a wall whether it's paper or glass or or concrete 
um, that removes the transparency and you can't see the white, whites of the eyes and you don't know what they're thinking. Transparency, and that's the crucial thing about the affiliate industry, is about transparency. And where there's no transparency, you think, oh, hang on, I shouldn't be doing that. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm all happy with transparency and everything. Are you enjoying the show so far? I sure hope so. You know, there's been an awful lot of discussion over the last few years about the value of coupon affiliates. Maybe even you have doubted whether there's value or not. Well, we at JEB Commerce wanted to find out, and the good news is the data is out there. So we interviewed all the top networks, did our own research, and compiled all the data from many reports already done about these affiliates on whether they add value or not. You see, we wanted to know the truth. And that resulted in an ebook that is now available to you at jebcommerce.com slash value. In this ebook, you'll find the three categories of coupon affiliates, information from Rakuten's marketing report on incrementality, data from Google and Comscore, data from Link Connector on commission stealing funnel participation, and data on brand perception, and so much more. If you're struggling with this debate and trying to determine your coupon strategy, you definitely want to download this free ebook. And I want you to have this 100% for free simply for being a listener of our podcast. You can access this free ebook at jebcommerce.com slash value, all for free. So thank you for listening. Now back to our show. Yeah, you know, there's a great book by Patrick Lancioni, a, a business consultant, uh, and he called it, it's called Getting Naked. And uh, mm. one of the things in there is, is don't put on a front if you don't understand or you think they're doing something wrong or any in relationship, exactly. just say it, get it out there. And mm. so that's one thing we try to practice, yeah. uh, you know, mm. of, of especially in the beginning, uh, you know, of a relationship. Now, I, I really mm. appreciate your insight in that. But tell me now, let's go right into affiliate marketing. Tell me what okay. publisher discovery is. You guys have some new things that we want to talk about today, but what is publisher discovery? Well, I suppose the, the one, 101 boilerplate is that uh, we're a platform. We analyze affiliate tracking globally, wherever we can find it. Um, and we analyze what goes from where to where. So we look at, say, awin1.com or shareasale.com. We see what are the actual affiliate links. So share a sale, oh, it's got N equals one, two, three, four, five, six. So that one, but not the corporate one for the PR stuff. Um, we analyze all of those. We see what's going in, where it's coming from, the linking publisher. We see it's going through to an advertiser. If it's going through to 404 and share a sale, we don't keep it because it's a dead link. We have got those links, and I think we'll do something with those sometime. Not sure what. Um, but uh, uh, so everything we've got is live links. There's about three and a half million sites with about 2.7 billion links going through to about 600,000 advertiser programs. And that's not 600,000 merchants. Um, some like, say, for instance, Zalando in Europe has got about 15 programs, one for Poland, one for Czech, one for, yeah, you know, for that, for every country and a separate programs, even though it's one company. Um, Adidas or Adidas, sorry, for the States, uh, has got um, um, several across different countries globally. So Japan will have a different one to um, China, to Australia, to whatever. Yeah, so 600,000. And we see what's linking to what. We can analyze those links. So for each publisher, you can see, okay, yeah, they're on 12 networks. They've got uh, 1,500 link, 1,500 advertisers on their on their website. Um, they own six other websites because they use the same Google Analytics account. So we can see those connections mm. and we can see 15 email addresses. Uh, we can also see a bit of the traffic idea from it and we can see the relevance to the vertical because of the advertisers they're linking through to. So when you click on our system and look for, I don't know, outdoor gear, you'll get anyone who's on REI or Moose Jaw or any of the other programs will say, oh, yep, yep, that's outdoor stuff. So ping, that will appear as quite relevant for that sector. So it's, it's not massively complicated. That's at the base level. Mm -hmm. We do use multiple different machine learning technologies as part of what we do. So, um, And um, our head of AI is a, a very clever chap, put it that way. <laughs> that's uh, it's done some great stuff yeah it sounds like a ton of data gathering how 
how uh, how are merchants using all that data, advertisers? At the simple level, um, it's a case of they've got to hit target. We need some new affiliates. How do we do it? Um, let's look at the vertical or if you are REI, say, okay, let's look at Moose Jaw, see who they're linking to that I haven't got. You can do it either way, that way. Um, so, okay, right, they're linking to there. Where's the gap in my program? Contact those guys. And there's all the social stuff in there as well. So if the email, as usual, goes into a slush pot somewhere, might get looked at once a month, you can always connect in social that way as well. So the, the tools are there uh, to, to enable to do that. Um, if you want to use just the Chrome extension. Yeah, tell me about that. That's a kind of a recent development, right? Yeah, sure. It's it's just based upon the data, but uh, anyone can download the free one. Uh, it'll tell you if you want to have a look at look behind the, the hood, look under the hood that uh, you've got to su- uh, subscribe, which is great. But you can just have a free trial to give it a sh- give it a shot. But if you're in search on your or your client's main keywords, looking in Google for I don't know garden sheds or plastic umbrellas or something like that. Every site that's got affiliate links will show up with a little octopus next to it when you've got the browser extension installed. Um, if you look on an affiliate site, it'll click show on the top of the um, the browser bar how many advertisers it links through to. So it just gives a, a real kind of, all oh, right, okay, that's cool. And if you like the look of it, you can hit the star on the, on the um, extension and that will just add that into your account for publish discovery so you can go back to it later and, and analyze it further. So it's kind of simplicity. It just take yeah. takes the hours of grunt out of searching Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I'm an advertiser and I'm launching a program, I know some of the first questions that we're asked is, who are my competitors using? Uh, what mm-hmm. partners do they work with? And then influencers. So right now you can go in the part, uh, publisher discovery and you can, you can search via a business uh, organization. Yeah. And- yeah. So, yeah. So if you are REI, you can put in Moose Jaw, Backcountry, whoever else you want. You can see every single one of the affiliates that we've got. Uh, we don't see everything, of course, because no scraper ever will. Um, but anyone who's got ordinary open links on a website will see. Um, you won't see necessarily things like Ebates, a quid coat or top cashback because the spiders aren't that clever. It can't log in. To it hasn't got an oh, account okay. for yeah, quick yeah. course. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if it's on a publicly available, the data is all publicly available. If you've got a few hundred years to actually look for it, um, but it's we kind of pull it all together. The time down tie quite up a with bit. This, yeah, tie well, it up with a with a bow and stick it on your on your computer. And that's the the main problem you solve, right? Is is time? Yeah. Uh, everyone wants yeah. new affiliates. Everyone wants that that fresh blood into their program and they want yeah. to hit new new markets and mm. if i'm going to go try we call it recreate the cu- customer's path to purchase so if i'm going to follow mm-hmm. that and try to identify every path that's made from intent to purchase and every web property every affiliate every publisher every influencer along mm. the way that's going to take me forever so you guys can yeah. create a list for an affiliate manager to work from in, in really, yeah. really no time at all. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, literally, so if you put those four competitors in, if you click on the extra tab, that'll just show you a gap analysis of your program versus your competitors, assuming we're oh, tracking your program. So you just click, hit, hit the button and say, right, okay, there's my low hanging fruit. <clears throat> and you might want to say, okay, well, let's have a look at the competitors. I'm on say link connector or tune. Um, and so you can choose from that list all the ones who are on your network, which are the low hanging fruit because yeah. you don't have technical integration, right? Yeah, no, that's exactly just add me to your program. Boom. Job yeah. done. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, if you, uh, if you're tracking yours to get that gap analysis, so for our listeners, I want you to hear that mm. a gap analysis, what do you have? Yeah. What do your competitors have? And where do they uh where do they have partners that you don't have that's huge now when yeah. i if uh, and when i do that you're essentially are you getting access to all my affiliates you have to right so you can see who we have it depends um we've if uh, we got some clients on cake or tune or whatever and they all have their own tracking on their own domains mm-hmm. if you're on share a sale it's just on share a sale.com a win one.com etc for the tracking nice and simple um 
impacts a bit more tricky, but we're analyzing several hundred of their domains now, so each program's on a separate one. Yeah. If you're on a private one and you've got a subscription, we'll add that into our tracking if you want it. Some of our clients opt not to, so that nobody else can find their affiliates. That was my question. Uh, <laughs> if if I have a relatively closed program and I want to see yeah. the gap analysis that's available, but I don't want to add mine, so they show up in yeah. others, that can be done. We might find it, though, because we have ways of looking around other sites. So we find a link and a domain that we don't recognize. We'll analyze that and index it anyway. What do you think is the accuracy of if the known universe, known uni or the universe of uh, affiliates for a given competitor or for a category, uh, you know, is 100 percent? What percentage mm -hmm. are you guys do you think you're finding? I don't really know. And it's, it's so difficult to, to, to say um, the nearest thing you can say is by who is link active and not every network shows who is link active really. Mm -hmm. Um, cause that's what we see. Um, but that is only link. Um, for instance, if you're on max bounty or something like that, link active might only be for a week of a month. So sometimes when we've indexed MB 38, for instance, which is one of the max bounty tracking domains, we'll see, oh yeah, there's a link, but it might be for a one week campaign on solar or something, which by week two has disappeared. We'll have indexed it. We then see, ah, oh, it's gone to a 404, so it comes back out. But that doesn't make them less relevant. It's still a domain that's being used for promoting solar. So mm -hmm. even if it comes out as looking like it's on a parking domain, it's still useful because, oh, okay, that's handy. He hasn't got a campaign running at the moment. Let's give him something he can play with. Uh, let's give him a new campaign to rent. Yeah. <laughs> and so a lot of that stuff happens. But it's difficult to know what percentage of them yeah. are. Most most networks will tell you they've got two million or whatever affiliates. Yeah, you got them signed up. Nobody's sending any clicks, or twenty thousand of them are sending clicks. But yeah. you know, it's same with um, people who think they've got thirty thousand affiliates signed up to their affiliate program. They'll have two thousand that are actually doing anything, and about twelve that are sending rev actual yeah. revenue and vo volume. Yeah, and that's one yeah. of the questions we get when we're talking to prospects, potential clients for JEB commerce, uh, to manage their affiliate program is, well, how many yeah. affiliates do you have? And, uh, and you know, we can spout those numbers, you know, too. Mm. Uh, and they, well, I want to, to get, I, I, we need to have X amount of affiliates active and we always try to work mm. with them because it's kind of, um, it's, it's gone the way of, I think, impressions as a key metric. Uh, mm, these things mm. can be manipulated quite easy. <clears throat> I can add a ton of affiliates to the program, but really, is that what you're looking for? Are you, are you looking for a number of partners that are working with you or are you mm. trying to get revenue, new customer acquisition, yeah. margin, any, you know, anything like that is the, the more yeah. relevant uh, number to, to track than, than total. Like, and like you said, you may have 30,000 affiliates, 2000 actively yeah. and maybe only 20, uh, producing for you. Yeah. And the guy in, in running the affiliate program has got a VP marketing saying, I want some metrics I can do. And one of the ones, Oh yeah, I can see how many affiliates. Yeah. He, stupidly he put how many affiliates on the program. Uh, okay. Yeah. So now they have to actually keep increasing that number regardless whether it's useful or not. And I think that is one of, well, there are multiple issues of VP marketing's CMOs, um, not understanding the difference. It's not a media spend. And most people, um, and you started off talking about the affiliate channel. Um, I, I'm with Gino. I don't see affiliate as a channel. Affiliate is a model. Mm. Because affiliate uses all the channels, SEO, PPC, True. it uses social influence. It uses So it's a model that sits across everything. Yeah. And as soon as a VP marketing guy or CMO understands that, you can then integrate affiliate horizontally across your channels. So you have a bunch of PPC affiliates. You can defend your brand yeah. on PPC using maybe a slightly different metric to the guys who are content fellas and maybe also using attribution, attribution so that you know everyone gets a fair crack of the whip. But if as long as you're understanding that it's not a channel, it's a model, it then sits horizontally under all of your, all of your um, vertical uh, channels and you can then start using affiliates holistically. But also think of affiliates not as being that media spend. Think of them as being 
whether it's one guy or a small group of guys like we've interviewed in the past, like the Curvy Fashionista or mm-hmm. um, Weather to Travel that we've got on our publisher's spotlight blogs, or whether it's a huge organization like finder.com, it's a relationship and it's a business relationship that you need to nurture. And like with your guys who are saying, I want to get this, got these numbers up, and it might take going to breakfast or lunch at Affiliate Summit to True. actually yeah. have that conversation say, okay, we want to do this. It's a partnership, and partnership marketing is a great way of putting it. The word affiliate has become va- rather kind of pejoratized, if that's a word, um, by being I think so. It's accurate. The, <laughs> yeah, it's the, the bottom feeders of, yeah, kind of yeah. lead gen, MLM, and all the other crap that happens at the bottom end of affiliate. Um, the affiliate industry as it should be without that stuff happening is a noble and great thing because that model the performance model is phenomenal and if everyone's on the same page and aligned in terms of a partnership it works to an absolute treat the ones that don't work are where it's not a partnership or where somebody higher up in the organization is that i need to cut that bit we need to cull our affiliate program what Uh, why Why? (laughs) what's the threat they haven't got a link on the page there's no cost Next year, they might have a new site that gets get live, and boom, all of a sudden, you, you then, after recruiting them, having called them to the program, they're going to say, uh, sorry, I'm sending my traffic elsewhere, mate. Um, so, yeah, it's a relationship, and it's a small industry, and you can't forget that. It How is. The, you know, global it is, and there might be thousands of people at Affiliate Summit. It's a small industry, and you're going to find somebody, you know, when you go around and you've pissed somebody off at one end of the – We'll, you're going to want to work with them next time. So make friends of everybody and uh, leave them with a smile. Yeah. You know, you bring up two things. One is the uh, like emerging affiliates and, and the culling. So that was mm. one of my questions. Mm. Do you do you have any metrics on age or activity with those affiliates? Do you, any way to gauge that? Mm. Not really as yet. No, um, we've only really been kind of garnering this, uh, uh, this data on for a couple of years or so, two or three years. Um, it doesn't have the historic data and network will do. Um, we'll have an idea within some of our integrations for people like Link Connector and Affiliate Future because we actually deal with their own data as well yeah. within the, a separate version of the platform, so not the public version. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult to tell that. Um, there are things we're working on which will give a bit of an idea, right. um, but that's for future gazing. Yeah, I just uh, figured out one of my <clears throat> first rant solo podcast episodes will be on <laughs> culling the affiliate program. Uh, you know, so you and I have been doing this a really long time. I started in 99. Uh, I have so many examples of someone joining the program. And a year, two years later, they had something that was profitable. They had an audience that they had created. And mm. we, I've never turned anyone away. I love the entrepreneurial spirit of the channel and the innovation. Every, uh, all these, mm. you know, thousands of individuals and organizations mm. are trying to create an audience, trying to serve an audience. They're creating their own brand and countless examples of a little bit of nurturing, a little bit of testing, cooperation, uh, conversation in the beginning years later Mm -hmm. turns into a strong partnership that they're producing millions of dollars for advertisers. And that little Mm -hmm. bit in the beginning led to so much more. We do the same thing. If, if you want to just remove affiliates from your program because they're inactive, I don't have time for that. And it's a waste of time. You've got the madness in with COVID where travel, some travel programs closed their program. What? WTF? WTF? What? Travel's going to (laughs) come back. It's performance. Yeah, it's not going to stop. And when a hotel chain says, right, we're closing our program, some VP of marketing up there has not got a clue, saw an expenditure and says, right, we've got to cut that half off. Yeah, for crying out loud, that's the way. Um, And uh, yeah. This is a family show, Chris. (laughs) Yep, exactly. Um, uh, Six months down the road, we're starting again. (laughs) And everyone's going to say, yeah, big time. Yeah, we're sending out somewhere else. Um, yeah, and, and have, they remember that. The boats. That's the oh, thing. God, they yeah. remember that. So it, it, that you talked about relationship. They, I, yeah. I, I made a mistake on a tracking and a commission change in 2001. That partner didn't work with me again. 
until like 2017. Mm. And they let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, come yeah. on. I'm a different human <laughs> being now. What can I do to yeah. help you? I was a young buck. <laughs> yeah. And they're people. And it's the people who have got to pay school fees or whatever else it might be, you know, dentist fees in the States. Everyone seems to spend the money on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, um, they're people. And if you're going to cut stuff like that, you know, for a, what you think at the time might be a great reason, then it is going to come back and bite you. Um, yeah, tricky. Have you noticed you have a really unique insight and a perspective on the industry? Have you noticed any changes like type of affiliates, categories performing well or being more active? I don't know if you have performance data, but do you have any, mm, you know, no. have you seen anything change from March of 2020 till, till now? Um, or along with, um, Awin and Partnerize, who both published it in something or other a while back, they've seen a huge influx of content based affiliates or content based publishers joining the network. So, a massive influx there. Yeah. And that is, it's, it's two sided. Firstly, you've got advertisers, merchants who are a bit more savvy, thinking, okay, right, we're going to cut anything that's CPM based because that basically is, it's, um, Yep. It's peeing down the river. Um, so anything's performance, great. So all of a sudden, the C-suite is aware of what affiliate is, it seems, on so many levels. But also the C-suite at big publishers like Hearst and, mm -hmm. you know, um, News International and the rest of them are putting a lot more time and effort into affiliate because it monetizes stuff from historical, you know, so beautifully. Um, yeah whether that's using a skim links type model or whether like with quite a lot of them, things like daily mail telegraph and Hearst and a few others they are on multiple programs and when you look on our little thing and you look at something like i don't know t3 magazine they're on 1200 programs which is mad you know um so they have a big team of program or affiliate managers in as a in the publisher but you've got a lot more content guys coming on board as well or girls often as well mm -hmm. um the influencer bit, which I always take with a slight pinch of, pinch of salt because there have been in, influencers since probably 88, I would guess. Um, anyone who's got an audience is an influencer. Yeah. Um, whether it's something like um, Top 10 Broadband, which has been around since about 1989, 1990 or something like that, um, that's got an audience and that was very influential. And back in 2003, I was galled to realise that um, as well as the CPA, some of these big guys with big audiences, they wanted a placement fee, or back in those days we called it a tenancy in the UK. Uh -huh, yeah. uh, if you wanted, if you if you wanted to have your your advert placed on on their site, you pay a fee as well as the CPA. Yeah. Uh, so that was a thing before influencers even were even kind of thought of, to be quite honest. Um, so the rise of social media has meant influencers are far more kind of in your face because social is in your face much more than websites ever were unless you were looking nowadays it's it's all out there uh, but that's a great thing it means that people who started from relatively low tech understanding which at the back in just internet days you had to have an understanding of php and be able to build yeah. websites even if it's a wix one to be an affiliate successfully Nowadays, you can be a social media influencer, have a big audience and make an absolute fortune yeah. because you put your um, acknowledgement, yes, there are affiliate links on these posts, boom, yeah. suddenly you're making thousands of dollars. Um, and everyone can go in from that perspective. By the time they've hit that level, think, okay, this is good. I need somewhere to store my back numbers. So that got great. That post got great engagement. What I want to do is to have that appear so they start building websites or somebody does it for them, yeah, which yeah. makes life much easier. So all of these guys are actually entering the affiliate space from the social area. So a lot of that kind of stuff seems to be happening. We're seeing other websites appearing in, in particularly in things like fashion, technology, online stuff. So a lot of people who were kind of influencers in those kinds of areas where there's a lot of throughput and social stuff, um, games and things like that as well. Um, they're appearing as new websites uh, within the data. That's fantastic. That's why our numbers go up. I think we're, over the past year, we went up by a million affiliate sites. So, you know, wow. and that's not just new domains being um, put in. So a lot of stuff happening. 
you know, one of the things I'm always, and still, I don't know why I'm surprised. I've been doing this for 20 some odd years. Every new client we get, there's a partner in there that, that either we discover or they brought with the program that they had that I've never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. and adding a million sites for, for our listeners, if you're thinking, Hey, I know I have all the affiliates. I know all of them. You're wrong. (laughs) Like that's, this, this is one of the, you know, everything is increasing. Um, and like Chris mentioned, the, the content publishers are coming in. Uh, and I've noticed this, Chris, whenever there's an economic downturn or uncertainty in the economy, I, I noticed it after nine 11, a huge influx of budget mm. to the performance, the partnership mm. space, um, yeah. during the election in the States where, uh, Bush and Gore, no one knew what was going on. Budgets changed. Then whenever there's upheaval mm. or uncertainty, budgets fly into, uh, the performance marketing space for so many mm. reasons. So I'm not mm. surprised that right now we're seeing a, a huge influx. Now I want to talk about some of your integrations. We've got a few minutes left. Um, okay. you recently integrated with link connector. So talk to me about the link connector integration and then just integrations in general with the, you know, these mm. other organizations, what does that look like? Uh, how does that help the advertiser? We integrate with different networks in different ways. Some are kind of almost just like a reseller. So they'll include it as part of their, um, of their deal and say, okay, if you're on a higher level, we'll give you link, uh, publisher discovery as part of it with link connector. It's far more in depth. Um, we've got a two-level product. So basically, um, the, the one which everyone sees from the website is analyzing the world of affiliates and the three and a half million sites that we've got in the network and in the system and pulling it down. With Link Connector, we use the AI technology on a completely separate piece of software, which does interface with the public one, but only one way is I go back to my biology lessons at school 40 odd years ago. It's like visking tubing. Stuff only goes one way. It doesn't go the other. Uh, semi-permeable membranes and all that stuff. Hey, um, so a huge bonus to the podcast today. You're getting a little biology <laughs> listeners. I mean, what, what else could you want? Sorry, I've got a mind like that. It just absorbs I love it, Chris. Like I love your, you've got so many things going on. I can't wait till we get to like have coffee or a, a beer yeah. somewhere face to face again. Yeah. Maybe Vegas. Maybe. I plan to be there. But yeah. But yeah. With Link Connector, um, we analyze their system. So basically we have a PR system with them and our software analyzes a few years worth of of uh, revenues across programs, which means that for each of the advertisers in the network, it now provides them with the ability to click on their publisher discovery tab on their interface. They can have a look and say, okay, here's my affiliates. <clears throat> what does the network recommend for me? And it uses our suggestions of um, relevance to them. So affiliates are relevant. So if you were most sure, um, then mm-hmm. anyone who's on Cabela's or REI or whatever would be quite useful. And so it'd recommend those guys to you. Um, it's not kind of, it's not saying that, yeah, this guy earns a fortune at that merchant. We can give him a value, but that's value across the whole. So, so it's, it's kind of, it's kind of looking through a curtain at all the affiliates. There they all are. And most networks, some of the bigger networks, AWIN have had this for a little while, partner eyes of, um, got their um oh i forgot what they call it their, their partner system basically yeah. it recommends potential affiliates for your program um we do it using ai and machine learning which means that it's far more accurate you're going to know they're more relevant you're going to know the value to the network so you know if it's going to be ebates they're going to be more valuable than coupon com or whatever it might be um <laughs> Come on, you know what i mean yeah <laughs> i love it um so <laughs> Um, so yeah, it, it gives you that and you can then go to this, click on the button at the end and it will send out via the link connector system to recruit them onto your program. So it goes through the same system okay, good. Yeah, and yeah. then the link connector system steps in. Great. Um, if they want to upgrade to use the external view as well, that bolts all the other rest, the rest of the three and a half million on the outside, which means that they can say, okay, we've. We've filled the program with guys from Link Connector. Let's have a look and see what's on Share of Sale, Avant Link, and CJ, and everywhere else in the world. And it will pull all of those in and give you the same recommendations. Say, okay, let's have a look from the outside. 
let's have a look at my vertical. So yeah, I'm in hunting and outdoor and stuff. Great. Um, or let's have a look at whoever's on, say, Cabela's or whatever it might be that might be on Impact or somewhere else. We can look at all those and you can have the same recommendations. And with the link connector, when you hit con contact, that will send an email out via link connector system, which enables you to recruit them. So it's a really deep integration um, and great benefit for the, um, the advertisers. Also, they get a free copy of the Chrome extension as well. So once they're kind of part of it, bang the Chrome extension in and they can be looking in search and add it into their link connector program, which means that they can, yeah. So, Fantastic. so just, it's kind of, a, it's a much deeper kind of thing than most of the network integrations we've got. Love that. And then uh, one last thing I wanted to talk about was you had a really good case study uh, about whiskey and oh, how, yeah. how whiskey. this organization, this company used the recruiting tool to not just the mm. affiliate channel, but open something completely new. So tell me, tell, tell our mm. listeners about that. Yeah, sure. The Master of Malt is actually a Budweiser brand, I think, um, based in UK. And um, so they spell whiskey the proper way without the E in it, you know, so. <laughs> um, uh, I, I get that jab. And, uh, I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like, uh, I do like a bit of bourbon as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they were kind of UK based. They could distribute across Europe because at the time Britain was part of Europe, but that's another story entirely. We're not going to go into here. And um, um, so what they did was they looked at their marketplace. They looked at the potential and they used the publisher discovery data to look for new affiliates. And he actually kind of timed this over a six, of, like to prove to his boss, he had to prove the effectiveness of this tool. So six months, he recruited 50 new affiliates and uh, quite a number of them were based in Germany, in the Nordics, so Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and things like that. And uh, two beauties of that. Firstly, the Nordics and Germany have much higher basket spend. They're happy to spend more on good whiskies, oh, okay. unlike the Brits who are a bit kind of, you know, penny pinching. Um, <laughs> so you had higher basket value. And over the six months, by the time the six months was up, those 50 new affiliates accounted for 26% of the overall wow. revenue for the website. So that, I think, proved the value of publisher discovery I think, to the boss. Yeah, and um, they used that to identify new geographic markets that yeah. they weren't in. They, they were able to get exactly. into them with mm. uh, without a huge branding campaign and advertising yeah. spend. It was paper for performance. Did they then go and kind of double down in other channels in those regions? I don't know. I didn't have that day, but you can read it on our website. We've got a nice sort of kind of um, blog post which talks about it. I really ought to make a proper case study you can download and print. There off, you go. But, uh, yeah, there's a job for us. We'll do that soon. <laughs> Get um, on that. Let us know. We'll have you back on the show. Uh, Chris, this has been yeah. fantastic. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, if they, if anyone wants to follow you, get in touch with Publisher Discovery, what's the best way for them to keep in touch, to, to get in touch? Oh, crikey. Um, You'll find with my surname, Tragic, T-R-A-D-G-E-T-T, -T. you'll find me everywhere. I'm all over the internet like a rash. Um, <laughs> I, think, I, think there, I think there are seven pages of my surname that are all me, which is a bit embarrassing. But, um, hey, you're a popular <laughs> but there, are only guy. 13, there are only 13 of us in the world with the same surname, I think. Oh, wow. Maybe 14 now. Yeah, so it's a bit rare. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, um, you can find me anywhere. But I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Facebook, Twitter. I think I'm probably on Instagram. Oh, only if you like bread, I'm on Instagram. Because okay. that's all I do on Instagram. Every Sunday morning, I post my, my Sunday morning bakes. Okay, I'm definitely... <laughs> so follow what, the bread. <laughs> what is your... And that's on Instagram. Yeah. How do yeah. I follow you and your bread on Instagram? What's the what's your handle? It's, it's Tragi, T-R-A-D-G-E-E, because my daughter had nicked the, the proper surname. Okay, awesome. Well, <laughs> if you get tragic, you'll, you get my daughter in Sydney. <laughs> everyone's takeaways today, we had a little biology and Chris bakes <laughs> bread, apparently. So I'm going to follow that. Chris, thank you so much again. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Always enjoy uh, our conversations. Uh, and definitely this one. I, I hope you have a wonderful day and, and appreciate your yeah. time today. Cheers. Well, first off, thank you, Chris, for being a guest on our podcast. Super, super insightful. You know, I learned a whole lot 
about this. Some of the key takeaways for me are in leadership, it really pays uh, to be humble and to have self-awareness. One thing Chris said that is, is something I'd really like to pull out of that is if you're not out of your depth as a leader, uh, you're not trying hard enough. Uh, and that really speaks to me. I, I've always felt uh, at many times during any given week that I am in over my head uh, and out of my depth. So hopefully that means that we are pushing and trying very, very hard. Uh, but he talked about this humility and awareness of knowing where your gaps are, what you're good at. And if you look at really what humility means, it's having an accurate uh, assessment and view, a right view of yourself, what that is in reality, uh, knowing what you're good at and what you're not good at and how important that is as an aspect uh, in uh, in leadership and, and running businesses. And really what he said is cut the bullshit, like get down to it. So we had a really good conversation about that. I really enjoyed it. Um, and, you know, if, if you are, if you're thinking you already know all your affiliates, you don't. I've been doing this for a really long time. I'm always discovering new ones. So there's these emerging markets to pull from. So if you want to find out more uh, about uh, how you can work with Publisher Discovery, uh, you can check them out at their website. You can go to to LinkedIn. Uh, I'm definitely going to follow Chris's Instagram account. I love Fred. I'd like to see what he's doing over there. Uh, that was really great. A, a big thing that I want you to pull from this as well is the, the geographic targeting power of affiliates. So a lot of times, and Chris said this pretty well, CMOs have a certain view of the affiliate channel. But th if you change that, think about having hundreds, thousands of testing opportunities for you to go and test offers, regions, clients, audiences, products, all of those things. And just like his example in the whiskey category, in the spirits category of that company using affiliates to break into a market, see if it had legs, if the consumers were there, and then being able to double down in all the other channels with minimal, minimal effort. A lot of times, and this is one thing Chris said so eloquently, the affiliate is viewed as a channel and not a model that you can use across channels. Now imagine if that your entire marketing organization looked at the affiliate as a resource to test and try new things. What markets would you be able to open? What revenue opportunities would you be able to find and develop and cultivate if you looked at your affiliates that way? Well, if you need help doing that, please let me know. Let us know at JEB Commerce. We can help you figure that out and identify those areas of our opportunities. And we've got two ways for you to do that. You can email gethelp at jebcommerce.com and we'll respond to you same day, maybe, maybe one day if we're towards the end of the day, but you can also go to calendly.com slash Jamie Birch and put time on my calendar directly. And we can sit and talk about uh, your program and what new markets you are trying to uh, attract and get into and what goals you have and how to use partnership marketing to achieve that. So Chris, thank you so much for joining us. Go to Publisher Discovery and learn for yourself what can be done. We're going to include a bunch of links to all their resources in our show notes, as well as a link to their website for more information. Now, if you found this podcast beneficial and enlightening, we would love it if you could leave us a five-star review at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and whatever podcast player that you use and share this with a friend. You know someone who would benefit from talking about learning about affiliate recruitment, leadership, and startups, then definitely send this over to them and share it on all your socials. I appreciate you very much for taking time to listen to the Profitable Performance Marketing Podcast as we discuss business leadership and all things affiliate marketing. Have a wonderful day. And uh, see you in Vegas. Oh, yeah. Unless you're coming across to the UK for PI Live, which gets to see you there. I don't think so. We'll see. Oh, man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're not thinking of acquiring a UK agency as well. Everybody else seems to be at it. Uh, you know, everyone's <laughs> doing a lot of acquisition. I, uh, I'm very comfortable where where we are at and uh but you never know what's in the future you never know